Hello and welcome to your favourite teacher. Today we're going to have a little look at an extract from chapter one of Jekyll and Hyde. We're going to be going through it as if it was a practice exam question. So the best thing for you to do is to grab a copy of your text and open it up. I'm going to read through it once and then I'm going to go through it with the focus of the exam question, which is, starting with this extract, how does Stevenson present Mr Hyde as a frightening outsider? Initially, you straight away you're going to be thinking yes for a start because you've got the character of Mr Hyde and there is so much to say about him. Uh, the question then goes on, write about how Stevenson presents Mr Hyde in this extract. Well, for that you're going to need your highlighters because you're going to go through and you're going to find your evidence there. And how Stevenson presents Mr Hyde in the novel as a whole. This is where you're going to have to engage that brain and that memory. So as I read through the extract, I just want you highlighting anything that you think is significant, um, but also maybe mind mapping a couple of other things that you remember about Hyde that you can include that draws on your knowledge uh, from the novel as a whole. So this is in this extract, Mr. Enfield tells Mr. Utterson about his meeting with Mr. Hyde. Did you ever remark that door, he asked, and when his companion had replied in the affirmative, it is connected in my mind, he added, with a very odd story. Indeed, said Mr. Utterson, with a slight change of voice. And what was that? Well, it was this way, returned Mr. Enfield. I was coming back from some place at the end of the world about three o'clock of a black winter morning and my way lay through a part of town where there was literally nothing to be seen but lamps, street after street, and all the folks asleep. Street after street, all lighted up as if for a procession, and all as empty as a church. Till, at last, I got into that state of mind where a man listens and listens and begins to long for the sight of a policeman. All at once, I saw two figures, one a little man who was stumping along eastward at a good walk and the other a girl of maybe eight or ten who was running as hard as she was able down a cross street. Well, sir, the two ran into one another, naturally enough at the corner, and then came the horrible part of the thing, for the man trampled calmly over the child's body and left her screaming on the ground. It sounds nothing to hear, but it was hellish to see. It wasn't like a man. It was like some damned juggernaut. I gave a, f a few hallo, took my heels, collared my gentleman, and brought him back to where there was already quite a crowd about the screaming child. He was perfectly cool and made no resistance, but gave me one look so ugly that it brought out the sweat on me like running. Okay, so this is where we first meet the character of Hyde. And again, it's met through, um, not through Mr. Utterson's eyes, but through the eyes of Mr. Enfield. So we're getting a really kind of secondhand view. But the impression is not a particularly good one. And we're going to look for things that make him seem like a frightening outsider. Well, the first thing that I would want to point out is the fact that... Um, at the end of the world, about three o'clock of a black winter morning. So the setting that Stevenson is using here, black winter morning is a classic case of pathetic fallacy where we've got the weather reflecting the mood. And black has connotations of, well, I was going to say darkness, but that's obvious, but of, of evil and frightening. And again, winter, there's a chill. All of these things really fit in with the gothic genre quite nicely. And it's the fact that there's a part of town where there is nothing to be seen. So again, Mr. Hyde might seem like an outsider here because he's not supposed to be here. There's no one else here. Everyone else is asleep. So Mr. Hyde is already standing apart from others because of the fact that he's out on these streets where everyone else is, is asleep or um, and the street is as empty as a church. So we've got reference here to religion um we have the running theme of religion versus science throughout the story as a whole um, and again that works quite nicely with good and evil because we know Hyde to be quite an evil character so these references um to church kind of juxtapose that so he's described as a little man who was stumbling along stumbling here uh kind of points to the fact that he is not 
completely natural in himself. He's not natural in his body. And we see that again later on uh, where he, it wasn't like a man. So this idea of him being a frightening outsider can almost tie in quite nicely to him being not quite human. So that was that's the evidence that you'd probably want to use for something like that. We've then got the act himself, trampled calmly. So that oxymoron here is really quite disturbing because the fact that he is so calm and casual about um, damaging this poor child and the fact that he's almost unaware of what's going on and has no consideration, again, is is quite um, unnatural, um, makes him seem like an outsider, but is also really quite frightening, the fact that there's no sense of self, there's no sense of, of, of right or wrong here. Um, I think we're always kind of afraid of people that, um, you know, are psychopaths or sociopaths. Um, and that's an example here of something like that. So the child is left screaming. Again, so we've got actions that are quite frightening. This is a, a reaction to, to him. Um, and he's also described as a damned juggernaut. So juggernaut um, is sort of means an overwhelming force it comes from uh, an indian word meaning big or huge that they would use to carry people in um but that's you don't need to know that but also damned here is very important so i've already mentioned the church and damnation means where you are trapped in hell so the fact that even though he's just using it as almost like a curse word in this instance like some damned juggernaut but it's actually interesting that that choice of of curse word um, juxtaposes the the religious reference earlier. Um, again, you can add in perfectly cool where you're talking about the trampled calmly to show that 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 really it doesn't impact him at all, and yet the effect on Enfield um, it causes a sweat. Sweat on me like running. Okay, so here we've got a number of different similes that Stevenson uses to to help build that picture. Um, we've got pathetic fallacy. Um, we've got the verbs, the, the way that he's stumbling. And we've got um, the oxymoron and the religious references. So those are the those are the things that, that Stevenson does to present Hyde in this extract. Now you want to think about Hyde in the novel as a whole. Um, so there's, as, as with um, most of your... Uh, practice questions you'll want to try and rack your brains for some anything that you can remember and um, there's a couple of words here that are used to describe words and phrases that are used to describe Hyde throughout that I literally just jotted down on my extract um, right before I even started reading so um, we've got damnable dwarfish ape-like fury um, feeling of deformity Satan's signature and the last one, Edward, Edward Hyde, alone in the ranks of men, was pure evil. So that might seem like a lot of, of evidence to include, but it, it's actually, there are things that are quite easy to remember. Ape-like fury, you can probably get that into any essay because there's so much to talk about with um, the animalistic imagery there. Um, but if you can try and remember Satan's signature, damnable, dwarfish, um, feeling of deformity, and as I said, the last one, Edward Hyde, alone in the ranks of men, was pure evil. If you can remember a few words and phrases like that to jot in to show how Stevenson presents Hyde in the rest of the novel, then you're going to open up a lot more um, opportunity to score some high marks. So let's just have a little think of... of um, so damnable is again like with damned uh, the damned jug juggernaut you could say as part of that evidence he later refers to him as damnable as well when Utterson refers to him as that dwarfish um again that he's he's not like a man it wasn't like a man we've got him described as dwarfish ape-like fury really primitive here um we know that the this is when Stevenson's writing this, you can draw on how um, how much impact Darwin's uh, origin of species had on Stevenson and the fact that he is referring to um, not quite man being, being ape-like shows how much that's influenced him here. Uh, feeling of deformity, all of these things show Hyde to be terrifying, but terrifying because they are, he is so separate from what... Um, the reader expects from a quotes normal man and normal Victorian gentleman. 
Um, if we just go back to Satan's signature, um, it's actually, they says that Satan's signature is written on his face. And that's almost like the idea that um, when an artist does some work, they sign it um, and it shows, you know, the, the masterpiece that they've created is theirs. And so here it's, it's not that th this man, this um, character of Hyde has not been created by God. He has been created by, um, you know, the god of evil satan so that's that in itself strikes fear in the reader and then that the last sentence that i had as as my evidence the edward hyde alone in the ranks of men was pure evil all of these things tie nicely the fact that it's satan the fact that he's deformed damnable and pure evil here but also note that part of this complex sentence um in the subordinate clause the alone in the ranks of men that shows how much of an outsider he is. And the fact that he is not, he, he's not just a bad man. He is something separate from from mankind. He is something completely different. And so I think that's really important um, to comment on that, that alone, alone. He stands alone. He is something separate from mankind. Um, so that's the kind of thing that you would need to do when you're answering this question. Now, so you think about how Stevenson presents Hyde and the way, the things that he uses. I've talked about these already. Uh, you include your evidence and you try really and discuss the different connotations of those words. Link them, if you can, to Stevenson's ideas. So Stevenson's ideas, the best way to remember that might be to think of it in terms of themes. So you could think, link it to Stevenson's ideas about good and evil or Stevenson's ideas about religion and science. Um, or, or Stevenson's ideas about what is mankind. Um, and then obviously making sure that you're constantly tying these things in to hide being a frightening outsider. That's the always got to be your focus. Don't just talk about anything that you can remember because you won't get marks for it. Okay, I hope that was helpful. Um, so that was an extract from chapter one of Jekyll and Hyde um, and just going through a practice exam question. And good luck.